President Trump and his allies have lost 59 lawsuits alleging election fraud. However, that hasn't stopped the president or his fans from propagating totally insane conspiracy theories involving dead communist leaders and the voting machines who loved them. Unfortunately for President Trump, this information is false. But you can imagine that perpetrating the falsity of these facts is really bad for business if you are Dominion or Smartmatic, some of the manufacturers of some of these voting machines. But could this be one of the rare cases of honest to goodness defamation? Well, maybe. And Smartmatic and Dominion are filing lawsuits worth billions of dollars. But before we continue, there are obviously some wild accusations being made, and there are billions of dollars at stake. And we here at Legal Eagle take these accusations very seriously. In fact, Smeagol at the Legal Eagle legal department is forcing me to display this disclaimer. Please read it carefully. By continuing with this video, you agree to be bound by the terms and conditions. Sponsored by Ting Mobile. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a defamation lawyer. Legal Eagle has covered defamation lawsuits many times. Remember the good old days of Devin Nunes versus Devin Nunes's cow, Tulsi Gabbard versus Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump versus the New York Times? Well, all of those cases got dismissed because they were just not good claims. It's really hard to make a viable defamation claim. However, when the leader of the Western world makes claims about voting systems, calling them rigged, he empowers other people to repeat those claims, even when they're patently false. That's why the pro-Trump media ecosystem is totally awash in conspiracy theories involving Dominion and Smartmatic, two of the companies which provided election support in 2020. And it was only a matter of time before those companies and their employees fought back. And one lawsuit has been filed, several other lawsuits have been threatened, and Trump allied media is retracting those claims like crazy. So let's take a look at the suits that Dominion and Smartmatic have filed and threatened to file against President Trump and his surrogates. But before we dig into those lawsuits, a word of warning. It's very easy to get caught up in cheering people using the institutions of government to stifle speech that we don't agree with. But the First Amendment exists for a reason. It protects speech that we like and speech that we don't like. And in the past, when people have filed suit against the New York Times or when President Trump filed suit against a tiny TV station in Wisconsin, it was clear that these defamation suits were bogus because those plaintiffs would never be able to meet their burden. It's hard to make a defamation claim and for very good reason. But just because we think that what's being stated is false, or we might think that the people who are propagating these falsities are, let's say, misinformed at best. That doesn't mean it should be any less hard for someone to be able to prove a defamation claim against them. It's my personal opinion, but I think that the First Amendment is uh, quite a good thing in our society, and we should be very, very reluctant to cheer on anyone uh, making a, a claim that could end up stifling speech that we just don't agree with. And additionally, in another context, or even in this particular context, this is a corporation trying to stifle criticism against that corporation. It just so happens that in this particular context, it seems like the criticisms are all in bad faith and are completely made up and false. But with that warning out of the way, let's talk about the lawsuits that have been filed with regards to the Dominion and Smartmatic voting machines. The first lawsuit that was filed was by an employee of Dominion, which is a company that makes voting machines. In 2020, Dominion partnered with more than 1,300 jurisdictions in the United States to provide various election support services. The plaintiff is Eric Coomer. He's the Director of Product Strategy and Security for Dominion. And if you haven't heard of Dr. Coomer, it's probably because you aren't spending enough time consuming pro-Trump media like Newsmax, OANN, and your uncle's Facebook page. Because there, he's practically a celebrity. In the aftermath of Biden's victory, conspiracy theorists about Dr. Coomer spread like wildfire all over conservative media. This started with a story story told by a, an entrepreneur and podcast host, Joseph Altman, who claims he eavesdropped on an Antifa conference call where Antifa activists discussed their evil plans. During this conference call, Altman says that someone who introduced himself as Eric from Dominion stated he would ensure the election went to Joe Biden. Here's Altman telling Eric Metaxas that he infiltrated Antifa. I had a group of people and we infiltrated um, Antifa. Then Altman discovered that there was a Dominion employee on the line, allegedly. You know, th this guy named Eric started talking and then somebody asked uh, who Eric was. And they said, Eric's a Dominion guy. Then Eric from Dominion said he was going to just, you know, rig the entire election. And I'm paraphrasing this, right? So I didn't write down word for word what he said. But uh, Eric responds, don't worry about the election. Trump's not going to win. I made effing sure of that. So, okay, he made effing sure of that. Uh, effing means very, very. 
Oldman offered no explanation of how he allegedly infiltrated the call, nor does he have a recording of it. Nevertheless, Altman decided that the Eric was actually Eric Coomer. He then decided that this was proof that Dr. Coomer may have just rigged the election for Joe Biden. And within days, the hashtags Eric Coomer, expose Eric Coomer, and arrest Eric Coomer were trending on social media. And of course, President Trump published similar false statements on Twitter, alleging that Dominion had interfered with the election. Eric Trump tweeted a photo of Dr. Coomer and alleged that he rigged the election. The other defendants published Altman false allegations about Dr. Coomer, and Altman appeared on YouTube videos, radio programs, and television shows. The host of these programs repeated the false allegations, and for example, Michelle Malkin interviewed Altman and started tweeting his allegations as if they were true. Quote, Trump's campaign lawyers identified Dr. Coomer in a nationally televised press conference where they described him as, quote, a vicious, vicious man who is, quote, close to Antifa, and falsely claimed that Dr. Coomer, quote, specifically says that they're going to fix this election, and that he, quote, had the election rigged for Mr. Biden. So seemingly in response to these allegations, Dr. Coomer sued all of the defendants for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. He also sued them for civil conspiracy, alleging they coordinated with each other to spread lies about Dr. Coomer himself. Okay, so those are the facts as alleged in the lawsuit. But before we dig into this particular lawsuit, let's examine what you have to prove to actually make a claim for defamation. Now, as you probably know, defamation is making a provably false statement of fact about a person or a company. Yes, companies can be the victim of defamation. But what are the elements? What do you have to prove to make a defamation claim in court? Well, first, the content of the communication has to be factual in nature. An opinion is not defamation. So if you get on Yelp and write a savage review of Popeye's chicken sandwich, this is an opinion. It's not fact. The internet may ratio you for preferring the Chick-fil-A sandwich, but Popeyes can't sue you for failing to recognize the factual truth because there is no factual truth to recognize. Most opinion is protected under First Amendment free speech. But on the other hand, if you write a bad review because you say that your chicken sandwich had a human finger in it, well, that's not an opinion anymore. That's a verifiable, provable fact. And if that's false, it could give rise to a claim for defamation, which takes us to the second element. The content of the communication must be false. Someone can say something mean that might cause harm to another person's reputation. Just because you've harmed someone's reputation doesn't mean that you have committed defamation. But that reputation harming statement must in fact be true. If it is true, it doesn't constitute defamation. If it's false and you have impugned someone's character, it's possible that that might give rise to a defamation claim. That's why we say that truth is an absolute defense to defamation. It does get a little bit wonky because truth is both an affirmative defense, something the defense can prove to defeat a claim of defamation, but it's also an element that the plaintiff has to prove. They have to prove that the original communication was in fact false. But that takes us to the third element, which is that the content is made with either negligence or actual malice. When a private person brings a defamation claim, they need to only show negligence by the party who published the communication or statement. In other words, that the person was negligent in saying something that was in fact false. But you probably know that public figures must prove an allegedly defamatory statement was made with what's called actual malice. Now, actual malice has absolutely nothing to do with maliciousness. If you take anything away from this video, it is that actual malice is not about the maliciousness with which someone repeats something that's false. Actual malice is just a legal term of art. That means that the person making the statement must have known that the statement was false or that the person making the statement made it with reckless disregard for that truth. In other words, that's a pretty high burden to show that someone was either knowingly saying something that was false or recklessly saying something that was false. Thus, if you are a public figure or a celebrity, a politician, and often a private business, you're subjected to proving your defamation claim by this higher standard of proof called actual malice. Which takes us to the fourth element, which is that the content could be defamation per se. This is also something that is often misunderstood. In most states, there is a subset of communications that are considered so harmful that damages to an injured person's reputation are assumed and the plaintiff doesn't need to prove damages. Generally, if you make a claim for defamation, you have to prove damages. But uh, for old, old reasons in law, uh, there are some categories that are just assumed that a person's reputation is damaged if you say it. So for example, in New York, there are four categories of speech where it's defamation per se. Statements that accuse someone of committing a serious crime, statements that injure a person's business or profession, statements that someone has a loathsome disease, and a statement that a person is unchaste. Yes, really, unchastity is one of the kinds of things that are defamation per se. If you are accused of being unchaste, 
you don't have to actually prove your damages in order to make an actual claim for defamation. And regarding damages, there's generally three different kinds. This goes for just about any civil claim you can make, but it's relevant when it comes to damages. First, there's special damages. Those are generally economic, things that the plaintiff actually has suffered. So in the context of defamation, that can mean loss of income. It could mean actual loss of business as a result of the defamation. And then there's general damages. These are things that are harder to put an actual monetary price tag on. Things like emotional damages, pain and suffering, or loss of consortium. Ask your parents about that one. And then there's punitive damages, things that aren't really related to the injury suffered itself, but are meant to actually punish the defendant. Things that are meant to prevent them from doing things again. And then finally, let's talk about some of the defenses that you can raise to a claim of defamation. Obviously, you can show that the statement that you made was true or substantially true, and that will generally defeat a claim for defamation. You can also show that the statement at issue is one of opinion rather than one of fact. So with that background, let's analyze some of the claims here. Defamation is a highly fact-specific claim to make. But here we can probably make some generalizations. First of all, the claimed communications here seem to be factual in nature. They accuse Mr. Coomer of actually doctoring voting machines. Uh, that doesn't seem like an issue of uh, opinion or of hyperbole. That seems like a verifiable fact that could or could not be true. It seems like it's false. While it's highly contentious on social media, the reality seems to be that these election-related claims are almost all made up. And with respect to the infiltrated Antifa phone call, that seems to be pure imagination. Sometimes you can raise the defense that the communications don't actually involve the person claiming the defamation, but here the social media posts and the actual news reports mention Dr. Coomer by name here. So uh, it seems like these communications are about him specifically. And of course, until these news reports and social media posts ran, Dr. Coomer was not a household name and it would be very difficult to prove that he was a public figure and thus he may benefit from the lower standard, not the uh, actual malice standard, but simply the negligence standard because he could prove that he is a private person rather than a, a public figure. So the Eric Coomer defamation lawsuit is the main one that's been filed so far, but it looks like others are on the horizon from both Dominion and Smartmatic. Now, Smartmatic and Dominion have started filing suit, but it doesn't look like they've sued everyone that they've threatened yet. But it's probably only a matter of time until all of these clowns receive a summons eventually. And part of the reason that they might not have filed so far is that many states have laws requiring a plaintiff to first request a retraction before they can recover certain types of damages in a defamation lawsuit. And both Dominion and Smartmatic are basically scorching the earth with their cease and desist letters and making certain news organizations bend over backwards to try and limit the damages that they might suffer in terms of a defamation lawsuit. And generally, if you want to know how how strong your defamation claim is, you can tell based on how quickly the potential defendants roll over and give you a retraction. And it's these kinds of demands for retractions that can lead to hilarious results, like even Newsmax muzzling Mike Lindell and an anchor walking away from him after he started talking about some of these unverified accusations. Can I ask our producers, can we uh, get out of here, please? You know that when even Newsmax is afraid to touch you, number one, you're a complete whack job, and number two, the retraction letter is doing its work. And Retraction law is a really interesting wrinkle in the sort of defamation lawsuit area. Generally, states that have retraction laws require a plaintiff to request a retraction or notify the defendant of the allegedly defamatory statement before they can file a lawsuit. The request or notice must be made within a reasonable period of time after publication of the allegedly defamatory statement. And if the defendant responds by airing a frank and full retraction of the defamatory statement, the defendant will be entitled to a reduction in certain types of damages. In a majority of states, a retraction prevents a plaintiff from recovering punitive damages unless a plaintiff can prove malice. In those states, even if the plaintiff proves malice, a timely retraction can mitigate most of the punitive damages. And some states put the onus on the plaintiff to be able to recover certain damages, and some states put the onus on the defendants to be able to limit their damages. So for example, in California, you have to send a letter or else you'll only get economic damages. But in New York, if the defendant prints or airs the retraction, then the defendant can limit the damages to economic damages only. So a retraction doesn't end the plaintiff's lawsuit, but it just reduces the amount and type of damages that are available to the plaintiff. So here, Dominion and Smartmatic have sent letters to several people and organizations which made false claims about the 2020 election. Smartmatic and Dominion have demanded that the 
the media organizations retract their false claims. So let's look at some of these retraction letters. The first is the Smartmatic versus Fox and Newsmax. Smartmatic's letter to Fox News accused the network of repeatedly airing false and defamatory statements about the company. Smartmatic said in the letter that Fox News had aided, quote, a concerted disinformation campaign presenting unsupported claims that the company conspired to change the results of the vote to benefit Joe Biden. Although most of the statements were made originally by Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, the allegations were repeated by Fox hosts like Lou Dobbs, Janine Pirro, and Maria Bartiromo. But the funny thing is, Smartmatic did not provide any services to swing states, nor did it tabulate votes outside of Los Angeles. But Fox News said Smartmatic was literally designed to change votes without detection and then send them out of the country for tabulation. And Newsmax and OANN had pushed the voting company conspiracies even harder than Fox News. We should make up stories because they'll be far more interesting. Fellas, are you sure all of this is e ethical? Newsmax claimed that Smartmatic had relationships with all of the right-wing scariest monsters, the Clintons, the Pelosi family, George Soros, and Hugo Chavez. Yet after they received the legal letter, they aired a detailed retraction. Here's a Newsmax host reading the script like a hostage. Newsmax has no evidence to the contrary. Dominion has stated the company has no ownership relationship with the Pelosi family, the Feinstein family, the Clinton family, Hugo Chavez, or the government of Venezuela. Newsmax also posted an article on the website. You can check out the scope of the admissions here. So these retractions may in fact reduce the damages that the news organizations face. Though a court does require that a retraction be made in the same manner as the original defamatory statement. So it's not clear that it's getting quite the same sort of coverage that the original allegations received, which was basically nonstop on these channels for days, if not weeks. Of course, if the news organizations repeat the false allegations, it might undo the retraction and a claim for defamation might have no limits in terms of the damages that they can seek. And now let's turn to the potential case of Smartmatic and Dominion versus OAN because the OAN network has its own interesting relationship with defamation claims. We should make up a bunch of reports about how dangerous it is to be alive. Oh boy. For one, YouTube suspended the OAN network for posting false information about COVID-19. But on top of that, OAN knows its way around around a defamation suit. At least it knows what it's like to be on the losing side of a defamation claim. OAN actually sued Rachel Maddow last year for defamation, claiming that she called the network paid Russian propaganda, which I guess Maddow actually did. Apparently an OAN contributor was moonlighting as a writer for Sputnik, the Kremlin's newspaper. The lawsuit was dismissed because the statement was Maddow's opinion. But here, predictably, OAN has doubled down on its groundless election fraud claims. The company responded to the Spartmatic and Dominion letters, which demanded that OAN present preserve all documents related to the defamatory statements or potentially defamatory statements, which is a pretty standard litigation tactic by demanding that Smartmatic and Dominion preserve all documents related to George Soros, which is interesting. And some, including the New York Times, have speculated that if this defamation suit were successful, it might be enough to shut down OAN. And then there's the potential case of Dominion versus Sidney Powell. In some, uh, Sidney Powell talked about Dominion's connections or purported connections with Nicolas Maduro, the company's use of algorithms to flip votes, the founder saying his machines can change a million votes for Biden, its relationship with Smartmatic, its relationship with George Soros, its relationship with Hugo Chavez, kickbacks it paid to the state of Georgia, its interference in the Hillary Clinton 2016 primary win and training election workers all over the country to flip for Biden. All of these allegations are demonstrably false, says Dominion and most rational people. And Powell has stated them as if they were true. She wrote about all these things in blog posts, went on TV and radio and repeated them, appeared at rallies and made false statements in court. And to further amplify her lies, she tagged Donald Trump on Twitter, ensuring that her claims would be heard around the world. Now, after sending Sidney Powell a cease and desist letter for the ages, Dominion eventually did file suit against her and Dominion sought $1.3 billion in damages but more on that later. Dominion is proceeding as if it will be treated as a public figure. Therefore, the complaint pleads that Powell acted with actual malice. As evidence of malice, the company accuses her of lying about every facet of the vote tallying process. Dominion claims this is defamation per se because Powell described Dominion as the perpetrator of, quote, the greatest crime this century, if not the life of the world. Her comments inspired others to say that Dominion committed, quote, the greatest crime in the history of the country. But as we've talked about, the difficulty for Dominion is proving that she acted with actual 
actual malice. Because to do so, they have to prove that she knew that what she was doing was wrong rather than she just was acting crazy or using hyperbole. And the company's strategy here is to argue that she's in the game for the money. That's why the emphasis that she fundraised off the effort, that she seems to have a 501c4 group to get the money, and that she ignores all of the evidence disproving her claims because... As for hyperbole, if Powell actually confined her comments to things like this was the biggest heist in the history of the world, she'd probably have a good argument that it was clearly meant as an exaggeration or even opinion. But Powell's problem here is that she spouts statistics and things that feel like facts, and her comments even found their way into President Trump's phone call with Brad Raffensperger, which I covered in a video a few weeks back. He claimed that the votes were shredded and flipped and massive numbers of dead people voted, and that Dominion took out the innards of the machines and replaced them with I don't know, a frozen yogurt machine or something. But Powell makes these same claims, despite the fact that they've been completely disproven. And not surprisingly, Dominion says that all of this naturally severely damaged the company's reputation and undermined its business. The company would likely have solid proof that Powell's claims have damaged its reputation and almost certainly have correspondence from existing clients or prospective clients saying that they won't continue to do business with Dominion because of all of these crazy allegations. Certainly, it seems clear that the fury over these claims have created serious pressure on local elections officials to cut ties with Dominion entirely. So, for these reasons, Dominion seeks punitive damages under both DC and Georgia law because they claim that the statements show willful misconduct, malice, wantonness, and conscious indifference to the facts. And speaking of illegal action, it's criminal how few people are actually subscribed to this channel. I was looking through my analytics and only a small percentage of viewers are actually subscribed. So if you find this video interesting or informative, hit that subscribe button. And just when you thought all the fun was over, Smartmatic dropped a complete bomb, a lawsuit seeking $2.7 billion against Fox, Fox News, Lou Dobbs, Maria Bartiromo, Janine Pirro, Rudy Giuliani, and Sidney Powell. I covered this very briefly before, but this is a somewhat unusual complaint. And it's very, very clear that the lawyers for Smartmatic know that this is as much a PR play as it is actual litigation. And the intro to this particular complaint, the document that starts the litigation, is pretty epic. It starts with one paragraph. The earth is round, two plus two equals four. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won the 2020 election for president and vice president of the United States. The election was not stolen, rigged, or fixed. These are facts, they are demonstrable and irrefutable. And then the lawsuit goes into paragraph number two. Defendants have always known these facts. They knew Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won the 2020 US election. They knew the election was not stolen. They knew the election was not rigged or fixed. They knew these truths just as they knew the earth is round and two plus two equals four. And then the complaint goes on in paragraphs 12 and 13. With this action, Smartmatic says, enough. Facts matter, truth matters. Defendants engage in a conspiracy to spread disinformation about Smartmatic. They lied, and they did so knowingly and intentionally. Smartmatic seeks to hold them accountable for those lies and for the damage that their lies have caused. Smartmatic brings 16 claims against defendants for defamation and disparagement. Smartmatic seeks to recover in excess of $2.7 billion for the economic and non-economic damage caused by defendants' disinformation campaign, as well as punitive damages. Finally, Smartmatic seeks a declaration requiring defendants to fully and completely retract their false statements and implications. So a couple of things about this Smartmatic complaint. First is that Dominion filed a suit for 1.3 billion, Smartmatic filed a suit for 2.7 billion dollars, and those are very, very big numbers. And if these allegations are true, they probably suffered a great deal of damages. But the thing about these particular complaints, and any complaint for that matter, is that these numbers are completely fanciful. You can basically put any number you want in these complaints. So just because they put these billions of dollars in damages into the thing that they're asking for the court, it has no bearing on the reality. It might be true, but most likely it's an inflated number designed to attract attention. And obviously these numbers attract attention. And it's uh, impossible not to recognize that sometimes litigation is as much about uh, PR as it is about actually getting the damages that you're owed. Now, the second thing is that these suits are probably stronger than your average defamation suit. In the Smartmatic complaint, there are over 250 pages of allegations. It's clear that these lawyers have done their homework and they're loaded for bear. And they talk a lot about the same statements and allegations that we've already covered in this video. Now, in performative defamation suits that really don't have any basis in law or fact, like for example, what Devin Nunes tends to do, you get very broad allegations where the lawyers characterize the statements, but don't actually say what the statements are because the claims are BS. But here, the lawyers painstakingly put every statement front and center verbatim into the complaint. 
complaint, which lends credence to the idea that these lawyers actually believe that the statements they are making accusations about are potentially defamatory. Now, the third thing is that these complaints would probably withstand a motion to dismiss. If you've watched this channel, you probably know that a motion to dismiss is taking all of the accusations that the plaintiff alleges as true. It assumes them to be true. It's just testing whether it would be legally sufficient if it was true. And if you get past the motion to dismiss, that means you're into discovery where you get to ask questions and demand documents from the other side. And when you're in that universe, that can be really, really bad for the defendants because broad categories of things that you don't want disclosed probably are disclosable in discovery. And then finally, the fourth thing is that, at least in the Smartmatic suit, there's 16 causes of action, which normally would give me pause because you often will just generate causes of action and claims uh, to try and throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. But here, all of the causes of action are for defamation or disparagement of false statements because they're just talking about different categories of topics of statements that were made. So it's not like they're claiming 16 different laws were broken, but rather mainly two sets of laws were broken. It's just there are different categories of statements that fall into those different buckets. So the fact that there are 16 claims doesn't really give me as much pause as it would in a different context. And then finally, Smartmatic is seeking punitive damages amongst other kinds of damages, which is interesting because punitive damages are hard to get. You have to show particularly odious and willful conduct to get punitive damages because those damages are meant to punish the defendant to make sure they don't do it again. Regular damages are just to compensate the victim. And if Smartmatic is successful in proving his claims, punitive damages might not be outside the realm of possibility. So this suit is by no means a slam dunk. It's probably probably stronger than average when it comes to political defamation suits. But if it were me, I would not want to be Fox News or any of the Fox News hosts who have been sued as a result of these claims. But if you published some of this election nonsense and Dominion sues you, then you'll need to call a good lawyer. And I'm afraid these guys might not be lawyers for very much longer. And the best way to make those phone calls is with Ting Mobile. I personally switched to Ting Mobile. Why? Because of this. Yes, this is a real bill that I got. But Ting Mobile has three brand new plans that make sure that that will never happen again. You can get talk and text for just $10 a month and pay for the data you use, get five gigabytes for $25 a month, and even unlimited for just $45 per month. Switching plans is actually really easy because you can keep your same phone number and use pretty much any phone. And the service is great too because Ting partners with several massive networks, very possibly the exact same network that you're using right now, but at a huge discount. Now contractually, I can't tell you which ones they contract with because I always respect contracts, but I've noticed no difference in my service since I switched. So whether you use two gigabytes or 20 gigabytes a month, there is a perfect Ting plan for you and your family. And if you don't use that much data and you're around Wi-Fi all the time, which most of us are considering we're probably working from home, you still have the flexibility of Ting's original plan, which can literally save you hundreds of dollars. Literally hundreds of dollars. Because Ting's flex plan gives you the option to pay for just what you use. It's a smarter, cheaper version of the same plan that they've always had. And now they're just adding unlimited versions as well, which are still way cheaper than everybody else. So if you want unlimited data, go crazy. So if you'd like to try out Ting Mobile, go to LegalEagle.Ting.com and you can use your last bill to compare just how much you would save. And Legal Eagles will also get a $25 service credit that could cover literally months of service. So just click on the link in the description or go to LegalEagle.Ting.com to save hundreds of dollars on your cell phone plan. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. But do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other real law reviews where I talk about all the crazy things that happened with the election and the Trump administration. So click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.